Hello, and welcome back to possibly part two, or welcome back from when I stopped talking one second ago on part one because <laughs> there wasn't enough. I'm still, as I'm sitting here looking at it, really not sure if this is going to be two parts, so I really just want to get to talking because I am very curious as to how I thought this could be two parts. Because I am technically right in the middle, but it seems like I have so little left to go compared to what I had already been talking about. So we shall see. There are no updates because I just recorded part one yesterday, so I don't really have a whole lot going on. Don't forget to go to the website if you haven't, madisonshelby.com, if you want to see more pictures from the case or if you want to read the transcript, anything like that. My sources are all on the website now instead of the show notes. If you're wondering where those went, and I kind of have a headache. The weather has been fluctuating a lot around here, so. Okay, so, where we left off was Diane had told her roommates, her roommates had an obligation to tell the Naval Academy or whatever. So they don't know what to do about Diane, because they don't really have any proof that she did this, but they also... They believe she did this. So they decided to suspend her and send her home. On her way home, she uses a layover. And instead of waiting for a plane to go back to Texas, she books a new plane to go to Colorado to see David. That is where we left off. So she gets to Colorado. Uh, David picks her up at the airport. They do normal stuff. They took a picture with both of them in there uniforms they allegedly had sex in his car and then they just talked I'm sure the topic of conversation was why did you tell everyone it did not take long for detectives to show up in Colorado Springs to talk to David and at first David denied everything he said he I had no I have no idea why Diane would make something up like that blah 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 David takes a lie detector test and fails And his sergeant was basically like, you need to tell the police what happened. And then the detectives told David that they already talked to his friend, whose house that he went to after they murdered Adrian, and they knew that he had changed his clothes and whatnot. So all of this prompts David to write a four-page confession that was described as a Danielle Steele novel. Now, the length of confession that I have is not four pages, so I might have gotten a condensed version. So if you're thinking, that doesn't seem like four pages. I also don't think it does. So I am now going to read David's confession that he wrote and signed on September 6th, 1996. David wrote, it was November 4th. I was giving a friend a ride home late one night after returning from a cross-country meet in Lubbock, Texas. Adrian surprised me by asking me to take some turns that I knew were out of the way. After being directed onto a dark path behind an old elementary school, I parked the car. The events that followed are not pleasing for me to relate, as they go completely against the moral background I have grown to appreciate. There were sexual activities short-lived and hardly appreciated. I did willingly concede to the girl in these actions, but I knew they were wrong. Never before had I participated in anything so meaningless and painful. Painful, that is, because I was letting down the one person I had sworn to be faithful to. These actions were immediately regretted. In an attempt to make them right, I confessed to my good friend Joseph hours later. I simply asked for him to listen, then forget. If anyone tells Diane, I said it will be me. The month that followed was one of guilt and shame. I was always being told by Diane that our relationship was pure perfect and pure. The love we shared would never be broken. No one would ever come between us. No one that is except one girl that had stolen from us our purity. I could never hold anything from Diane, nor she from me. She knew in my eyes that something was wrong the moment I decided to confess. When I did tell her, I thought the very life in her had been torn away. She was angry. She was violent. She was broken. For at least an hour, she screamed sobs that I wouldn't have thought possible. It wasn't just jealousy. For Diane, she had been betrayed, deceived, and forgotten all in one meaningless instant in November. The purity which she held so dear had been tainted in that one unclean act. Diane had always held her virginity as one of her highest virtues. When we agreed to be married, she finally let her guard down long enough for our teenage hormones to kick in. 
When this precious relationship we had was damaged by my thoughtless actions, the only thing that could satisfy her womanly vengeance was the life of the one that had, for an instant, taken her place. Diane's parents had similar problems in their relationship. She knew her father had often cheated on her mother. Diane didn't want Adrian to be the same woman for me that her father had in his affair. The request of Adrian's life was not for a second taken lightly by me. I couldn't even believe she would ask that of me. While Diane's beautiful eyes have always played the strings of my heart effortlessly, I couldn't imagine life without her. Not for a second did I want to lose her. I didn't have any harsh feelings for Adrian, but no one could stand between me and Diane. I was totally in love with her and always will be. I regret it now, for never did I imagine the heartache it would cause my school, my friends, Adrian's family, or even my community. I guess I just shut it out. Yeah, you just sort of thought nobody would care. That's very interesting. He said, I guess I shut it all out of my mind that instant when I convinced myself Diane was even worth murder. After Diane gave me the ultimatum, I thought long and hard about how to carry out the crime. I was stupid, but I was in love. The plan was to call Adrian and convince her to come out to my car. That worked. The plan was to drive her out near Joe Pool Lake. That worked. The plan was to, and this was not easy for me to confess, break her young neck and sink her to the bottom of the lake with the weights that ended up being hit into her head. That didn't work. Diane was headed on the back of the car. It was late. It was about 12.30 a.m. on the morning of December 4th, 1995. I realized too late that all those quick, painless snaps seen in movies were just your usual Hollywood stunts. The quick and painless crime turned out to be something that basically scared the bleep out of Diane and I. We realized that it was either her or us, and Diane struck her on the back of the head with one of the weights while I held her. I could see in Diane's eyes that she was confused and scared. She was first acting out of passionate rage, but now she was fighting from instinct. Adrian somehow crawled through the window and, to our horror, ran off. I was panicky and just grabbed the 9mm to follow her. To our relief, at that time, she was too injured from the head wounds to go far. She ran into a nearby field and collapsed. I wanted to just jump in and drive off. We were both shaken and even surprised by the nature of our actions. Neither Diane nor myself were ever violent people. In that short instant, I knew I couldn't leave the key witness to our crime alive. I just pointed and shot. I was very confused and scared. I probably looked like the proverbial headless chicken running around the crime scene. I fired again and ran to the car. Diane and I drove off. The first things out of our mouths were, I love you, followed by Diane's, we shouldn't have done that, David. Well, nice time to tell me. I just wanted it to be a dream. We took the quickest route to I-20 when we decided to head to a well-trusted friend's home, John Green. John Green did it exactly as I suspected, allowed us through his window, the usual entrance place to his room, allowed us to clean up and collect our wits, and even loaned me a pair of shorts. My clothing had blood stains on them, and we disposed of, the, disposed of them in a dumpster near Diane's house. We then went back to Diane's house, where we cleaned out the car and went to, the, and went to sleep by the fire. The next day, we returned the weights to my house. Diane was in shock. I was just scared. Neither one of us knew why anymore. We had just done that. The following days at school were so mentally tough. They make my summer at the Air Force Academy look like a walk in the park. Never had I even imagined so much guilt. They announced it on the intercom. My friends talked about it in the halls. Everywhere I turned, someone was crying or just staring in shock for reasons I alone was the cause of. How do you not understand what you're doing when you're doing something of that caliber? If I could just butt in. How do you not... How do you think people are not going to be devastated? How do you think you're just going to walk through school and everyone's going to be normal after finding out their classmate was brutally murdered? He said, I saw Adrian's mother in the grocery stores. I read articles of how her family was coping in the papers. One thing in particular has haunted me constantly for the past eight months. I read a quote from Linda Jones. That's Adrian's mom. She said, I hope that her killer is out there and he's just being eaten up with guilt. When I read that, I just wanted it all to go away. I wanted to be able to drive Adrian back home to go to sleep and wake up, wake back up on December 3rd, free to make my decisions all over again. Diane wanted to go back also. For weeks, her infatuation was with just being able to go back before September 26th, when she wrecked my truck and injured her hand. She wanted to change that, and that she wanted to keep me from going to Lubbock. Diane was constantly depressed from the guilt. She was also scared that I would be arrested. She used to worry herself sick in school over me and have to call me as soon as school was out to make sure I was okay. It didn't really matter, however, what any police or detectives found. What happened was over. Adrian was gone. I was responsible, and it wasn't going away. Signed, David C. Graham on September 6, 1996. 
So the police then recovered the gun and the weights from David's house and then went to talk to Diane, who I read was back in Texas at this time. And she was, this was just confusing to me. I couldn't figure out if they were still in the same city or if he was in Colorado and she was in Texas. But it does sound like she was in Texas and I'm pretty sure he would be in Colorado. I don't know why they would have brought him back to Texas quite yet. They probably did after this, but I'm sure he gave his confession from Colorado. I'm just working this out in real time with you. I bring this up because there is a part where people say their confessions were too similar. But I'm wondering if David had pre-typed a confession and then Diane read it when she was there and then left. Because how would she know what his confession was if they weren't even in the same city? If they're alleging she was like trying to copy it. Okay, so on September 6, 1996, that same day... Diane gives a voluntary statement to the Grand Prairie Police Department at 8.43 a.m., which I will now read in full. Hers is kind of longer. I wonder if hers was the four-page one, but I swear the article said that his was the four-page one that looked like a Danielle Steele novel. Okay, now I'm going to read this in full. So she has this first paragraph basically saying she has then read her Miranda rights. She has, like, the right to remain silent. She's doing this voluntarily. If she needs a lawyer, she can get one, whatever. She said, I do not want to talk to a lawyer before or during the answering of any questions or the making of the statement. I do hereby knowingly and voluntarily waive and give up my above-explained rights and do make the following voluntary statement of my own free will and without promises or offers of leniency or favors and through no fear, coercion of threats or physical harm by any person whosoever. She's really making it clear that she's just doing this, and that's it. There's no deal. She's not scared. She doesn't want to talk to a lawyer, which you should always talk to a lawyer. So here is Diane's statement. She said, I remember that night, I think November 4th, 1995. She says, I think, like it's not permanently ingrained in her memory. And David showed up at my doorstep. He had just come back from Lubbock, and he had this look in his eyes. I was horrible. He looked so scared. He had this red, stuffed animal dog in his hands. I could tell something was wrong, but I figured he was just tired, so he wanted to stay and spend the night. A month later, I was coming into my house with him, and I was questioning him about past relationships because he had always told me that I was his first real girlfriend. I thought it was kind of strange because most people have some kind of relationship of one kind or another. I remember he read off a list of names of girls he had known or gone places with that were kind of significant. I will never forget him mentioning the name Adrian because that name kind of stuck in my head. I guess I was asking a lot of questions. For some reason, I felt like I needed to ask about Adrian. He held back a lot, and we just went inside my house. We decided to walk inside of the house because we had been sitting inside of the car. When we got inside, we got into a big fight because, as always, he was trying to make me study for the SAT, and I didn't want to, which is so weird because, like, Diane's whole thing is she loves studying, so it's weird that she wouldn't want to study for the SAT. I mean, I know why she won't want to study for the SAT in this precise moment, because she wants to talk about Adrian. But it sounds like she never wanted to study for the SAT, and I find that odd. She said, we fought for a while, and at the end, when we stopped fighting and had calmed down, he just looked at me and said, I have something to tell you that is really important. I kind of knew what he was going to tell me just by the way he looked at me. He told me, you haven't been the only girl in my life. He said, I have had sex with someone else before. I just looked at him in shock, and I asked, did he mean he wasn't a virgin when he met me? And he said he was. She said, I think that made me feel even worse, because he mentioned that he lost his virginity to me, but that he had been with someone else. She worded that kind of weird. She was missing some words. Basically, what she's saying is, he was a virgin when they met. He lost his virginity to Diane, so that has to mean that he had slept with someone else between now and that time, which is cheating. She said, all I could do was question him and scream and blame myself for everything. I remember reaching out for this big brass thing, this brass rod, and aiming for him and trying to hit him because I was so upset. He took it away from me and tried to calm me down because I was screaming so hysterically. He was trying to protect himself from getting hurt, but he was also trying to protect me from hurting myself because I kept ramming my head against the walls. And when I was on the ground, I kept ramming my head into the floor trying to crack my skull. I just didn't want to live with what he had said to me. I felt like I had lost everything. My hand wasn't working the way it should because she had gotten those pens on it. And my family wasn't in the best financial state, and now he was telling me the one thing I prized more than anything else was taken away. I don't think I was thinking. In fact, I know I wasn't thinking. I screamed at him, kill her, kill her. 
He was just so scared that he wasn't about to say no to me. I was still banging my head against the floor. All David wanted to do was make everything better. It seemed like him agreeing to do that was the only thing that calmed me down. David promised that he would do that, and David never has broken a promise to me before. On December 2nd, 1995, we spent basically the weekend trying to get a hold of Adrian. Nothing was really premeditated because I think we were both acting in passion. This is incorrect. <laughs> Just so you aware, to get a crime of passion, the example that I always think of or I thought of when we talked about this in law school and that I always think of when this comes up and people talk about crime of passion do you remember in the first season of American Horror Story when Jessica Lange walks up the stairs and the flashbacks and the um whatever you know what I'm talking about she walks up the stairs she opens the door and sees her husband sleeping with the maid and she immediately reaches in her purse and shoots Moira Moira? Did I make that up? I kid, certainly. I'm rewatching Shit's Creek right now. No, what's her name? American Horror Story. There's not going to be a swimming pool, you stupid slut. While I am looking for this, the first two seasons of American Horror Story are some of the best TV I have ever seen. Her name is Moira. Wow. Who would have thought? What was I getting at? Oh, yeah. That is a crime of passion. You literally have to be, it has to happen, like, the moment you find out something like this. The second that you, like, take a second, think about it, calm down, it is no longer a crime of passion. I don't know if you would count something, I don't know, if you would count something that close as premeditated, like, if you still shoot them within the same five minutes. But what Diane and David are doing is... Quite literally, (laughs) the definition of premeditated. They are pre-planning out how to murder Adrian. This is not a crime of passion. I'm very passionate about (laughs) people thinking things are crimes of passion. It has to be instant. You have to not even think about it. You have to be so hurt, enraged, filled with passion that you don't even think and you do something in that moment. And that is my PSA. Where was I? Okay, so she says the only time David planned anything was when he sat me down at his house for about five minutes to calm me down and throw stuff in a bag. You're still saying there was a plan. The plan, again, the aforementioned plan that you're saying doesn't exist. The plan was for David to break her neck and sink her body to the bottom of the Joe Pool Lake. About 12.30 a.m. on December 4th, 1995, we were at his house. David had said he would meet Adrian at about 12.30, so we were late. We were driving my green Mazda protege. It seemed like David put together what he was going to do really quick because he really didn't have much time to think. The day prior, he had spent more time calming me down than thinking about what he was going to do. I would wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares. I couldn't even look at his face because I thought he was a different person. I had horrible pictures running through my head about what happened between him and Adrian, and they made me feel really sick. We met her at about 1.35 a.m. on December 4th, 1995 at her house. David had called her at about 10.30 p.m. on December 3rd, 1995, and it was prearranged for her to come out. She thought she was coming out so they could have sex again. I still don't believe that. By the way, I think I said it in the last, yeah. In the possible part one, the alleged part one, that Adrian, he probably made up a story that he needed help or he was sad or maybe even feeling guilty about what they had did before and he needed help. I think that's what got Adrian out of the house. Call me crazy, but I just don't, I don't find that part believable. Even even knowing they had done it before and Adrian's very flirty, it just, I don't know if I believe that. Anyway, Diane said she came up to the car and got in. I was in the trunk and David was driving. I remember being real scared because at a time like that, when you kind of know what's happening, you really don't trust anyone. I remember wanting to turn back. I was afraid to move, so I just laid still in the trunk. David later told me he felt the same way that he wanted to turn back. David usually always has a gun of some sort on him all the time. That's Texas for you. I knew that he had the um, Makarov 9mm with him. I also knew that he had the weights. I don't think we knew what we were really going to do. It was more of like, we're going to get out there and just do it. David never specified an exact location of where he was going, because I don't think he even knew where he was going. We picked up Adrian at her house, and we drove for about 15 or 20 minutes. 
There's a hatch in the back seat so you can let it down and it leads into the back seat from the trunk. This is normal, I think. You can all picture this in your head. Like some t- some cars, like hatchbacks or even some cars with closed trunks, you can pull the whole back of the back seat down and you can see the entrance to the truck. Truck. Trunk. Diane continued. David pulled over to the side of the road and Adrian had already leaned her seat back and he started, I guess, pretending that he was going to kiss her and he motioned for me to pull the hatch down. I remember getting out and seeing that and it just made me all the more angry. She said I knew he didn't mean it, but it just made a bunch of pictures run in my head again. When she saw me, she kind of freaked out and David held her down and said, it's okay, we just want to talk to you. I think at that point I could kind of tell he didn't want to do anything. I think that's Diane saying, like, at that point, you could tell David really didn't want to kill her or that he really didn't want to hook up with Adrian. I'm not sure. Diane said I asked Adrian about she and David having sex, and she said that she didn't enjoy it, that there was too much guilt. I guess it was the way she looked at me when she said it that made me so angry. Even now, I can only remember her eyes, but not her face. I remember screaming at David all over again. All of it just became so real. I think I got kind of hysterical, and I screamed, just do it, just do it. David started wrestling with her, basically, and she was trying to get away from him. I remember being scared that she was going to hurt him, so I reached back where I knew the weights were on the ground to try and hit her with it. I missed. I was just so nervous. My hands were shaking too much. Probably the third time I did hit her on the head with the weight. Things kind of calmed down real quick, and I was still really scared. I think the whole time the only thing going through my mind was what I was doing, but I knew that things had gone too far and I couldn't stop. Somehow stopping seemed scarier than going on. David turned his back. I don't really remember why, and she slipped out of the window and ran off. We started to follow her with the car, but he didn't go far because she collapsed into a field on the side of the road. David jumped out of the car with his gun because he didn't want to leave someone there that could say something against us. He started running after her, but she collapsed before he got to her. He ran back to the car, and he said, She's dead. I was just too scared, and I said, Are you sure? No, she's not. I told him to shoot her. She's not dead. He was really panicky, and he wanted to take off, but he went back to where she was because I told him to. He shot her twice in the head. He ran back and jumped in the car and drove off as quick as he could. I remember the first words out of his mouth were, I love you, baby. Do you believe me now? I said, yes, I believe you. I love you, too. I said, what have we done? His reply was, I don't know. I can't believe we just did that. We drove off. The whole time, I was pretty panicky. We both know what we had done was wrong, and we both regretted it. I don't think anything could compare to the fear and the horrible, nauseous feeling that I had all week. We went to John Green's house. I took David's clothes and cleaned up his clothes for him. I think we were afraid to look at each other, and in some ways I think we were really afraid of each other. When I finished cleaning up his clothes, we walked from the bathroom to John Green's bedroom, and I just stood there looking and just stood there looking at each other for a while until I broke down crying because I was so scared, and we held each other and prayed that God would forgive us for what we had done. He drove me to my house on Gatlinburg, and we pulled the car into the garage. There was blood in the car. David was too sick to clean up anything. He was really pale and sick to his stomach. He wouldn't even step back in that car for months because it was too horrible of a memory. So I cleaned it up while he was in my bedroom asleep. I told him to just go to sleep because he had gone into the bathroom to vomit. He said he was pretty sick to his stomach. I really don't remember what he did with the gun right away, but months later he hid it in the attic at his dad's house. He left the weights in my car. I remember later I told him to come sleep by the fire, so we both went out there and slept by the fire the whole time thinking the police were going to come to the door and arrest us. His father called that morning to make sure he was up so he could go to school. Up to that point, I don't think either of us really thought she was dead. But his father asked David over the phone, Did you hear about that girl from Mansfield that was killed? After he said that, we basically knew that she was dead. Those next few weeks were horrible because I couldn't eat and neither could he. He was always really jittery and pale-faced. We were both afraid that each day together would be our last. I remember we went to church a lot, praying that God would forgive us and somehow put us at peace. This is what... No, I'm not... How do people think that God will forgive you for murdering a young woman in cold blood, but, like, God won't love you if you're gay? I just don't understand. But that's just, like, my general concern with religion. (laughs) She said, because we were living in fear, I know God has forgiven us. I have spent a lot of time thinking after that. I would pray day and night that God would send me back so I can change what had happened. I would often start crying and tell David she didn't have to die. I guess I was kind of obsessed with praying and hoping that God would answer my prayers and send me back to fix everything. In a lot of ways, I wish I could have known her better. Everyone talked about how sweet she was, and that's something I will never know. My only comfort was that everything that happens happens for a reason. Sure. 
And maybe that maybe that we didn't know what it was, but we hoped in time that we would find out because I don't see how all that pain could have a reason. That's a a pain that you caused. What do you mean? Everything happens for a reason. Are you out of your mind? Diane then said, I have read the four pages of the statement, each page of which bears my signature, and the facts contained therein are true and correct. The statement was finished at 9.46 a.m. on the 6th day of September 1996. And then she signed it. So that was September 6th. So it's nine months after the murder. Remember, Adrian was murdered in December of 1995. It was a Friday when they wrote these confessions. So... Some of their younger friends, maybe even some of the friends their age who had went off to college. Because, you know, freshman in college and senior in high school are, like, so close. Sometimes you still will go to football games or hang out, like, in your town. Whatever. So, people are finding this out, like, right before the Friday night football game. Also, the mayor of their town, the mayor of Mansfield, was, like, on a trip somewhere. So, he was at an airport when he... Where was he? Somewhere kind of far away, like Colorado or something. He's at the airport, and he hears the news station, and they're talking about the town he's the mayor of. And he's like, that's very odd. I'm very far away from there. It's a small town. I don't know why on earth they would be talking about that. And come to find out, it was because Diane and David had confessed to killing Adrian. He was like, well, that's not really what you want your town to be in the news about. Um, Sarah Layton, who was in ROTC with David, said that I screamed at the top of my lungs, dropped the phone, busted out crying, and got up and went to the bathroom and threw up for about a half hour after she had found out that it was David who had killed Adrian. Layton knew there would be an announcement during the game about David being arrested. I don't know if they, like, literally mean an announcement, like, over the loudspeaker. I think that would be very odd, Or I'm wondering if she's thinking, like, they're going to do an announcement about Adrian and her murder, murderers finally being found, something like that. Either way, she's like, I know this is going to, like, publicly become a thing at this football game. So she was focused on finding her friend and her ROTC classmate, Joanna Christensen, before, like, the word really got out publicly. But she couldn't get a hold of her on the phone, and she didn't meet up with her until, um... Christensen was about to walk on the field for, like, the color guard presentation, like that halftime program that they do. Program. That made me sound really old. So it turns out Christensen had already heard the news, and as Leighton walked up to her friend, she saw that she was in tears. Leighton remembers that she was in the middle of the field having a nervous breakdown. Like, she went out there to do this color guard presentation and just cried the entire time. After halftime, Christensen walked off the field and collapsed on the ground and sobbed. Christensen, who looked up to David like a brother, still can't figure out how the boy who looked who liked Garfield and the one they called Chipmunk when he smiled could have been involved in the murder with which he had been charged. What do you say, she said. One of your really good friends that you looked up to and admired and wanted to follow in his footsteps is now dressed up in orange and stuck in a jail cell. She said she will probably never believe that he did it. Like, she is very like, I, I don't believe it now and I don't know that I ever will just because of how she knew him before. And she wonders if he is making all this up to cover cover up something. So now we're going to get to the trial, which is pretty short because we have a full confession. So while waiting for the trial, Diane continued to study in her jail cell as if she possibly would be getting out of jail. Her trial began in February of 1998. At this point, she had written her confession already, so there wasn't much they could do. Her defense tried to paint the idea that she was only that she only confessed under duress and that she had no part in murdering Adrian and it was all David. She said she just memorized the confession David had written and signed and copied that. Instead of the idea that Diane was so distraught that she forced David to kill Adrian because she had all this control under over David and he was completely under her power, they were like, well, no. David was actually the controlling one and killed Adrian so he could continue to keep and have control. They were like, well, no, David was actually the one controlling and killed Adrian so he could continue to keep and have control over Diane. They submitted a letter into evidence that David had written to show how controlling he was. He wrote in this letter, Diane, please respond to this letter soon. I'm crazy about you, all caps. You know that. You are all mine, caps. So don't let anyone else near you. You are supposed to follow my rules as I follow yours. Here are mine. Please send yours. So he's like, 
I'll follow your rules, you'll follow mine. You haven't given me any, but here are the rules I'm going to give you. The rules were don't let guys come into your room. If they're already in there, go elsewhere. Don't talk to any former Marines unless business related. If anyone male or female hugs, kisses, or touches you, deck them. Write at least 30 pages a week. Love your night, Sir David. Just throwing it in there for like her mental clarity. Just cause Write 30 pages a week just to stay fresh. One of Diane's friends testified that she was camping with Diane and David a few months after Adrian's murder, and Diane had ran to her tent in the middle of the night saying she was terrified of David, and then David walked up to the tent and took a giant knife and started slashing holes in the tent. In her closing statement, Assistant Prosecutor Michelle Hartman told jurors that Diane acted as judge, jury, and executioner. The last statement that Prosecutor Mike Parrish made to the jury in his closing argument was, Lives matter, truth matters, Adrian Jones matters. The only verdict that you can return with the evidence that you have is guilty of capital murder. After six hours of deliberation over two days, the jury found Diane Zamora guilty of capital murder. She received a mandatory sentence of life in prison, eligible for parole after 40 years. One juror who requested anonymity told the Associated Press that her confession was the most damning piece of evidence. The juror said no matter how you look at it, Adrian Jones would still be alive if not for Diane Zamora. That seemed obvious enough, though the specifics were sometimes cloudy. Which is true, if it wasn't for Diane freaking out, and arguably, she, David, she would be alive if it wasn't for David. But Diane is the one who told David to kill her. Even if she did nothing else after that, David was acting under... Not her power, but, like, under the assumption that if he did this, everything would be okay. He's, like, doing this maybe not for Diane, but so that he can continue to have Diane. Which was a smart way of looking at it. As a juror, sometimes it's hard to see the big picture. Like, are some of the details cloudy? Yes. But at the end of the day, you know that if this one thing hadn't happened, the rest of it wouldn't have been set in motion. If Diane wouldn't have told David to kill Adrian... David had already said as much as that he wouldn't have killed her. He said he had no ill will towards Adrian. It's not like David was going to kill Adrian anyway, or that he would have killed her anyway, even if Diane hadn't said something. I don't think he would have. So Diane essentially put this entire thing in motion. That is what the jury was saying. And I do believe Adrian's mom said she didn't want either of them to get the death penalty. We see this often in cases that involve children or like teens things like that because adrian's mom or usually the victim of a teenage the victim is a teenager their parents realize this is like really terrible i have lost a child to senseless murder they still have it in their hearts as parents to look at other parents and be like just because i lost my child doesn't mean that you have to lose your child. It doesn't mean that you have to watch your child die, which I do think is always, I don't, to be the bigger person like that is amazing in a way because it's easy to assume that, like, you took my daughter's life. I, not that I want to take your life, but you don't really deserve to live if you think she didn't deserve to live. But to be the bigger person and be like, we don't need to make the death of one teenager be the death of three teenagers in this town. Like, I would like for you to be punished, but I don't think that needs to happen. So David's trial was in July of 1998. It went pretty similarly. The defense claimed that Diane was retaliating against Adrian instead of punishing David for the sexual encounter. There was a weird thing where David testified that he had lied and that he never actually had sex with Adrian that night, and he just said that to get a rise out of Diane. Which I don't know what you would get out of that by making that up. And then he eventually took that back and said, no, that was the lie. I did actually have sex with Adrian. And he said his defense told him to lie about having sex with Adrian. I'm not really sure what is going on here or why that even happened. But it was just like, I take it back. No, I untake it back immediately. Like I said, there's not a whole lot about his trial Just because these confessions were so damning, they were allowed to be used as evidence. There's really nothing else you need to do. So um, the jury for his trial deliberated for eight hours over two days, and he got 
the exact same sentence as Diane, a mandatory sentence of life in prison, eligible for parole after 40 years. If you're trying to do the math, they will be eligible for parole, parole if you're my age when we turn 40 because they were sentenced close to when we were born, which, if you think about it, is crazy. Anyway, jury foreman William Wright said later that it was, again, David's confession to the murder of Adrian Jones that was the key piece of evidence that led to him being guilty. The defense was claiming that his confession was an attempt to protect Diane. They're saying, yeah, he wrote this, but it was Diane who did it, and he wrote this just to protect her, which is what his friend thought happened she was like i'll never believe that he did this he has to be saying he did this to protect diane from something else that's what his defense tried to go with after the sentence was passed adrian's father mother and two brothers were allowed to address david and thank the jurors adrian's mom said david every evening i remember my daughter and all i can think about was her fear her tears and her realization that you betrayed her trust I hope that everyone remembers our daughter with the integrity that she's that she has because she's still among us. And then she said, I remember her eyes with joy. You will remember her eyes with fear, which is so sad to think about. Like her last moments were of her being terrified. Adrian's brother, Justin, said, I have no hate for you. I can't hate an animal for their ignorant, dumb, and blind. So he's basically saying, like, it's not even worth hating you because you're not even a person. Like, you're a monster. But Adrian's other brother, Scott, said, He ruined so many lives, so many families, and unlike my brother, I can hate an animal. I can hate David Graham. So, some updates. See, this was longer than I thought. I don't know what I was thinking. Guys, I was really going through it with these two parts. So, Diane got married in prison, but not to David. She married Stephen Mora, a fellow Texas inmate, He had committed auto theft and burglary and was in prison for threatening someone related to one of his cases. They had met through the mail, and despite not ever meeting, they decided to get married in 2003 in the county's first by-proxy marriage, which is exactly what it sounds like. This means two people in real life stood in for them outside of prison, and then someone married them in Diane and Stephen's names. It was like her mom and her mom's friend, I believe. The two ended up divorcing in 2008. I don't know if they ever even met. Diane has exhausted all of her appeals, so she will not be getting out any earlier than 40 years. And it said that she really still didn't appear remorseful at any time. She'll be eligible for parole when she's 58 years old, which honestly is a gift. That's a whole life. That you get to live after that. She gave an interview to Dateline in 2007. She said. Okay. She she gives this interview to Dateline. Let me preface this. This is like her swan song. Like her last ditch effort. She's trying to save herself. She's implicating David. She's just like. This is her really trying to get out of being guilty of this crime. So she said she had tried to break up with David a month before the murder, and she felt David was punishing her for that. That's why he lied and said he slept with Adrian, even though it wasn't true. So she's saying, yeah, David never slept with Adrian. And if you're wondering why he would make up something like that, it's because I tried to break up with him a month before that, so he was trying to get back at me. She said she went along with David's plan to kill Adrian because she just wanted to talk to Adrian, and she didn't believe David. So she's saying, I'll go along with all of this just so I can get in the car with Adrian and be like, is he lying to me? Did you guys sleep together? She said she was hiding in the trunk because she didn't think Adrian would have gotten in the car if she was there, which is probably true. So this isn't like an interview, more of like an article. So the person asking these questions, I think is really, it's a good interview. They're really not, not that they're not on her side, but they're not just letting her breeze through this interview and say whatever she wants. They're like, okay, so you wanted to get into the car to talk with Adrian. You don't believe David. That's fine. But why were you hiding in the trunk of the car? She's like, oh, because Adrian wouldn't have gotten in the car. Then Diane said they parked and she got out of the trunk and questioned her and asked if she liked sleeping with her boyfriend. And allegedly Adrian had said, no, there was too much guilt. And then Adrian said she was just kind of stunned and she just sat there. She's like, okay, well, maybe this is true. She's thinking. 
And then age, she said Adrian and David started fighting. And Diane said, I did pull her hair, but then Adrian started running. And Diane ran after her, but David told her to go back in the car. And then he followed Adrian and he killed her. Diane claimed she never hit Adrian with a weight and that the wound was actually from David hitting her in the head with his gun. And actually, at the trial, the medical examiner said the wound was consistent with the gun that he had examined. Now, the question was, at this trial, have any of the items you examined, like, fit the wound on the head? And he said, yes, the gun matched the wound on the head. I don't know if he had any, if he examined the weights. I don't know if the weights had been there, if he would have been like, yes, it matches the gun and these weights, and it could have been either one. I'm not sure, but... They did say the gun matched the wound on Adrian's head, so she's saying I didn't even hit her. That's not true, and they knew it wasn't true. Diane had talked about how controlling David was, and that he would write and email her that he owned her and that she was his. The same thing we had been talking about. She's, like, referencing all these emails where he talks about how he owns her, she's his, things like that. She also takes a polygraph test, which is, like, the most ridiculous part of this interview. It's so... She was taking this polygraph test, and she is doing things that are known to help you deceive a polygraph test. She's doing, like, a lot of very heavy breathing. Like, her chest is puffing in and out, which is, like, a known technique to... I don't know if it will deceive a polygraph, but it will for sure mess up the results of the polygraph because it can't get a good read on you. So so the interviewer is asking her, like, Diane, why were you doing this? And she maintains that she was just very nervous and she was hyperventilating, and that's why it looked like that. And she just really wanted to take this polygraph test to show people that she didn't do it. So most of the test was invalid because of all of the breathing breathing cheating techniques she was doing. But she did fail the one question about whether or not she intended to kill Adrian. That was the only one where they sort of got a read on it, and the read was that it was a lie. David, on the other hand, has expressed remorse several times in interviews and will be eligible for parole at the same time. He applied for an appeal in 1999 and was also denied. I have read some of his interviews. He, like, immediately was like, I really wish I wouldn't have done that. I would do anything to not do it again. I wouldn't be surprised if David makes parole and Diane doesn't because of how different they acted. It's like Pamela Smart all over again. I believe if Pamela Smart would have just immediately been remorseful and admitted to what she had done, that she would be out of prison right now. She would have been out of prison years ago. But because she has never been sorry, she has never admitted the role that she played in that whole thing going down, they can't let her out. They're like, listen, you don't even think you did anything. Like, you have to admit you did this before we can even start to talk about letting you loose into the world um before diane's trial even began so this is all still going on there was a made for tv movie about what had happened about adrian david and diane it was called love's deadly triangle the texas cadet murder holly marie combs actually played diane from charmed and um pretty little liars aria's mom so yeah that was the murder of Adrian Jones, the case of uh, David Graham, Diane Zamora, the cadet killers, whatever you want to call it. I need to quit um, guessing and estimating times because I clearly have no idea what the hell is going on. I have no reference of page to time anymore. Everything's gone. So thank you for sticking around with part two because unless I have to edit this 20 minutes out of this, this is definitely going to be two parts. I will admit that the breakup of this was kind of weird. How part two is just mostly their confessions in a very short trial. But like I said, it seemed like a clean break at the time. So I do apologize if you thought this ended up wonky. I want to again thank Ashley for suggesting this so much. I can't believe I hadn't heard of this. It was such an, not an easy case to throw throw together, but there's just so much out there about this. It's crazy. I had never heard of it. So thank you very much for bringing it to my attention so that I can bring it to everyone else's attention. If you're doing the math, those two will be eligible for parole 2036, 2037 maybe. Not that far away. We will see them out of prison in our lifetime, I think. It's crazy that Diane isn't at all remorseful, but she isn't the one who actually murdered Adrian. But David is very remorseful, but he is the one who pulled the trigger. So I don't know how... 
that will factor in. It might keep them on level ground. One might not get out before the other if either of them ever get out. I'm wondering if Ashley can update us on this, if there are any, because I believe she is from the area, if there are any, like, whisperings of if David and Diane are ever going to get out of prison. I would love to know the inside scoop on that. Ashley, if you're listening, which I hope you are, <laughs> let us know if you hear anything about town. And thank you so much for sticking with me today, sticking with me through my small mental confusion about one or two parts. How long is this going to be? It's going to be short. No way it's going to be long. No way it's going to be one long part. No way it's going to be two extremely short parts. <laughs> I'm sure you guys are used to it. And I will see you. If you're a subscriber, I will see you Monday. I hope you enjoyed last Monday's episode. I will see you Monday for another. And I will see you Wednesday for a brand new episode. Don't forget to throw a suggestion on the website if you have it. And I will see you next week. Bye.